Chapter 1 Nebula There is no easy way from the earth to the stars. From Seneca the Younger, Hercules The regulator coupler twists smoothly under his wrench, eased by well-oiled parts and a steady hand, increasing the amount of fuel that's funneling into the engines by only a slight amount. It's not a huge repair, but Tubbo can already tell the difference, antenna flicking lightly as the humming whine from the engines changes in pitch to something more steady. He grins, and flips the wrench into one of his lower hands, clambers out of the maintenance hatch in the floor, and toes it shut with a socked foot so he won't accidentally fall into it later. Stretching his top arms above his head, and the lower ones in front of him, Tubbo pops his back and flexes his wings out, only wincing in mild discomfort as the wound along his left side pulls uncomfortably. Rubbing at it absent-mindedly with his lower right arm, Tubbo begins putting his tools away in neat order, singing under his breath to the music drifting through the speakers overhead. The engines are well taken care of, enough that they don't rattle the Asachi, but he can pick up their vibrations with his antenna, bobs his head in time to that pulsating beat. Tubbo's heard other pilots and travelers complain about the incessant trembling in the recycled air of their ships, how it drove them crazy, but it's never bothered him. He misses it, actually, whenever he's planet-side, hates not having the comforting thrum of his ship around him, the whining drone of the engines and smooth glide of machinery. Clicking his toolbox shut, Tubbo hefts it under one arm and makes sure it's properly stowed away, safety latches locking it into place so it won't go hurling around the next time he has to do some evasive flying. He spreads one hand out along the side of the Asachi, smiling fondly, stroking over the metal plating, fingertips tracing across grooves and rivets, knows the shape of each one by heart. There's a lot of pilots that just fly for the paycheck, or because they couldn't be bothered to find anything else to do. But that's not why Tubbo's out here. Not why he bitches and groans any time he actually has to land. He's a pilot because he loves it. Because there's nothing like hurtling through the black expanse of space with a thousand winking stars around you, or navigating the tricky, tight press of asteroid belts. And any good pilot worth their tool set knows without a shadow of a doubt that their ship isn't just a piece of machinery to get you from point A to point B. It's a partnership, a bond that can never be broken. And as long as Tubbo takes care of the Asachi, it'll take care of him. Their mutual trust, keeping them both moving and out of danger. And that's all he could ever need. With his repair work done, Tubbo scales the ladder built into the wall that leads up to the top deck, and steps into the cockpit. He drops into his chair and starts to run a systems diagnosis, just to make sure they're still on the correct course and nothing else needs attention. A couple of screens pop up in front of him, and he waves through each one after he scans it over, only pausing on the autopilot readout, because, wow, are they making great time or what? The Asachi is fast. But this is a little insane even for it, and Tubbo furrows his brow and expands the screen. According to the autopilot, they'll be back in HQ in less than an hour, which doesn't make any sense because Tubbo knows for a fact that before he went down to do repairs, he had a solid 20 hours of flight time left. The realization hits him at the same time as a new pop-up appears on the HUD, taking over most of the viewport and blocking the trails of light whizzing by in hyperspace. Well, fuck me, I guess, Tubbo thinks, hitting accept because there's really no other choice. Just hopes it doesn't look like he hasn't slept in over a day as the hideous, scrunched-up photo is replaced by a live feed. Good morning, bitch. Morning, dickhead. Tubbo responds with a smile, crossing his arms as he reclines in his chair. And Tommy grins back like a madman, jerks his head at him. I see you're still alive despite your best efforts. I could say the same to you, Akka. They haven't kicked you out for insubordination yet. Tubbo laughs, and Tommy scoffs, tossing his head to the side as he declares, I'm an absolute delight. Honestly, I'm surprised they haven't made me fleet captain yet, Tubbs. Rolling his eyes, 
Tubbo says with as much sarcasm as physically possible. Ah, uh, yeah, of course. Because the Imperial Sunfleet is just so known for giving out commissions to every shithead teenager. Hey, I'm almost twenty and you know it, bitch. Fuck off. And just you watch, I'll be the first one. They'll make statues of me. Carve the name Tomothy in it across the galaxy. Tommy sweeps his hand out to demonstrate the vast swathe of prestige he's going to have. Wings ruffling behind him in excitement, looking for everything in the world like every starry-eyed recruit fresh off the transport. He's mostly joking, but there was a time when they were both like that, eager to prove their talents and make a name for themselves. But now, Tommy sits there in his crisp blue and red uniform, Tubbo in his grey and orange bomber, thousands of light years apart. If that happens, I'm drawing dicks on all of them. Tubbo promises with a lazy grin and laughs at the indignant noise Tommy makes, speckled grey wings flaring out behind him. Do fucking not, or, or I'll, I'll... You can't threaten me, fancy naval boy. Tubbo snorts, ducks his head quickly to the side to try and hide a yawn that snuck up on him, snickers halfway coherently. Don't forget I'm the criminal here. It's a stupid thing to say kills the jovial mood instantly as Tommy straightens up, carefree smile melting off his face. You're not a criminal. They've had this argument before. Tubbo could easily lay out all the beats to it, but it never changes, and his lower hand picks at some loose threads on his jacket, upper ones wrapping a nervous staccato against the armrests as Tubbo shrugs. Well, I mean, by practically every definition I am a- no. You work for the Syndicate, which is an illegal organization, run out of the jurisdiction of the Empire and Tubbo. Tommy begins, in a warning tone, and Tubbo's quick to snap his mouth shut, shuffles his arms around himself and stares forlornly at the way his best friend's entire posture droops, not for the first time mourning that they had to end up here, mumbles softly. Sorry. N no, it's fine. I just... You know that I... Tommy sighs, scratching a hand through his hair, mussing it out of the regulation style. Sounds like he murmurs mostly to himself. I just wish you'd stayed. I wish you'd come with me, Tubbo thinks, but doesn't say. Knows there's no point. Because while Tommy does love him, he loves his home planet more, and it was no contest, really. Tubbo only asked him once, mistakenly. Amidst tears and furious packing, and the deafening silence that followed his plea was more than enough to convince him to never ask again. I couldn't stay. You know that. Tubbo says softly, and at the way Tommy nods his head in exhausted resignation, he can practically hear the silent answer to his unspoken comment, and I couldn't go with you. It's quiet after that, and Tubbo's antenna twitch in time to the humming song of the engines running, moving to the tempo of the Asachi working around him. One, two, three. Breathe in, breathe out. You're here. One, two, three. You're fine. You can get out. You're not trapped. Comfort settles in his limbs at the reminder, and he runs reverential fingers over the edges of the consoles like you would something holy. And in a way, it is. This ship having saved him time and time again, and Tubbo's forever grateful for what the Asachi gives him, what it represents, freedom. How's your side? It healing all right? Tommy asks as a blatant topic change, and it drags Tubbo from his thoughts, has one of his hands flitting down out of habit to press lightly along the edges of the blaster wound. Yeah. The, um, the blistering has gotten a lot better. Tubbo says, as his fingers run over the bumpy med patch. Doesn't think it'd be a good idea to tell Tommy about how he ripped it open a few days ago, running down some back alleyways. The frayed nerves under his skin send sharp sparks of pain through his body at the pressure. Torn muscles and ligaments pulling too much and not enough in different spots, leaving his entire left side aching. But it had stopped oozing blood last time he checked on it, so Tubbo was counting it as a lot better. G good. That's good. 
You getting enough rest? Tommy looks at him with a critical eye, squinting at his face for a long time, searching for signs of overexertion that are hopefully not as present as Tubbo feels like they are. Clicks his tongue and grumbles. That old boar better not be working you too hard, or I swear to the creators I will kill his ass. I'm fine, Tommy. They've kept me on D-rank jobs for the last two weeks. It sucks so many balls. Tubbo complains, leaves the twitching skin on his left side alone to toss his hands out exasperatedly. Which is such utter bullshit. The last time Dream got shot, he was only stuck on medley for like a week. He's expecting Tommy to commiserate with him, because if there's one thing the Navy hates more than Techno, it's Dream, who, at this point, probably has a higher successful capture rate than the entire Imperial fleet combined. Tommy has a bit of a weird fixation on the shapeshifter, alternating between being personally impressed and in awe of his prowess, and violently opposed to everything he does, swept up in imperial propaganda because he feels like he has to. Usually, the latter wins out. But instead of puffing up and yelling, like Tubbo so desperately wants him to do, so they can stop talking about serious things, Tommy just pushes his mouth to the side. Doesn't he have, like, a whole team, though? Tubbo's hands clench around the armrests of his chair, because he knows that tone, knows this argument too. Queen's past, not this again. Have you thought about if you just stop being so fucking stubborn and get a partner? Wow, would you look at that? Entering syndicate airspace, gotta go, Toms. Tubbo yells to cut off the familiar reprimand, starts fiddling around with controls, even though he's about a solid 15 minutes away from needing to drop out of light speed. Have a good day at class. I'll let you know when I head out again. Tobo, do not hang up on me. I swear to actual fucking... Love you too. Okay, bye. Tobo shouts as he quickly tabs out of the call, hits a couple buttons to send any incoming transmissions from Tommy's handheld to his inbox, and sags backwards with a long, drawn-out sigh. Scrubbing two hands across his face, Tobo digs fingers into his tired eyes and wipes the grime out of them. Very aware of how exhausted he is all of a sudden. The Syndicate usually required that its members operate in teams, but Tubbo's stubborn as all fuck and a good pilot, and Techno had eventually caved, was more interested in having him join under those conditions than lose his piloting skills to another organization. Besides, as Tubbo drags his hands down his face, looks over to the empty seat next to his in the cockpit, there's only one other person he'd ever have sit next to him, and he's thousands of light years away. It's not that much longer before a different alert is demanding his attention, and Tubbo opens the audio channel with one hand, already starting the process of exiting hyperspace with his others, and a sweet voice filters out of the speakers. Entering Syndicate Controlled Airspace, please state your identification, credentials, or purpose. Pilot ID M32N79, Craft ID IK9075R0, Tubbo recites absentmindedly, easing back on the throttle as the engines wind down, the blinding flash of hyperspace blinking out around him as HQ comes into view, the great hulking shape of it backlit by a red giant, other ships passing him on their way out or back in, and Tubbo grins, takes over the controls as Nikki says with a clear smile in her voice. Cleared for landing in Hangar 6. Welcome home, Tubbo. An excerpt from the Declassified Galactic Survival Guide. If one is to be travelling the greater beyond, one must have some understanding of how space chooses to govern itself, lest you fall victim to a series of complicated rules and laws that honestly make little to no sense otherwise. The governing systems of the universe are as varied and sometimes as unknowable as the beings that populate it, which does make it rather difficult to try and find some common ground, but your author has come up with a pretty concise rule of thumb, assuming, that is, that you have thumbs. The long and short of it is, space is needlessly confusing, and there is no clear answer. Your author, personally, recommends being in possession of a fast ship 
and little to no inhibition when it comes to shooting first and asking questions later. But if pressed, would argue that at this present moment, and at about 70,000 light-years beyond the event horizon, as the universe is always expanding and growing more complicated by the nanosecond, that the largest governing powers would be divided between the Kapal of Tantan IV, the Verbund Eason, a common garden snail, and the Sun Empire of Nerox. Tabo throws his duffel at the unclaimed bunk in his room, doesn't bother taking his boots off, and passes out face first onto his own bed. He's asleep for maybe half an hour before he starts getting too hot, props himself up enough to jerk his jacket off, and then flops back over, but something's still not right. He tosses and turns for a while, eventually gets fed up enough to yank a pillow and blanket off his bunk, spreads them out on the floor, and lays with his back up against the bulkhead. The metal plating is freezing against the bare skin of Tubbo's back around his wings, just like the dark expanse of open space, and he hums sleepily, presses a palm against the floor to feel the vibration of the space station working under him, and is out within seconds. He usually dreams about flying, adrenaline and pure elation pumping through his body as he navigates close quarters, the rush of having to make split-second decisions and calculations, the familiar shape of flight controls under his hands, more instinctual than anything else ever has been. It's no different this time, but as Tubbo stares down at his hands wrapped confidently around the controls of the Asachi, there's suddenly golden bands embroidered around the edges of his sleeves, and when he blinks, they morph into shackles, chaining him to the console, restricting his movements, and he tries to jerk back, but there's a hand gripping his shoulder hard. A voice, a commanding voice, snapping, Do as you're told, Ensign. Tubbo wakes up with a jolt, both sets of arms immediately checking the other for anything around his wrists. But they're bare, and he lets out a breath he didn't know he'd been holding, sits up from the floor with a groan. His body protests vehemently about him sleeping on unrelenting plastisteel, but Tubbo's well-versed at ignoring minor aches and pains, runs the routine of popping his joints until they stop bitching quite as much. His blaster wound is really twinging as he gets to his feet, but there's no blood soaking through the med patch when Tubbo pulls his shirt up to check, so he leaves it for now, more distracted by the hollow aching in his stomach. Tubbo fumbles his jacket from the floor and stumbles out of his room, wincing at the bright lights illuminating the hallway as he tugs it on. Most of HQ is made up of a natural, colored plastisteel, something close to a warm gray and not the eye-aching, vibrant white that the Imperial fleet uses. And it's not so sterile, because unlike the fleet, there's not really any rules here on what they can and can't do. There are several dorm halls in the station, but this one has been Tubbo's personal favorite to live on. When people are home and not sleeping, they leave their doors swished open, giving brief glimpses into the small spaces they get to call their own, always welcoming to anyone looking to drop in for a minute. Personal preferences and decor styles bleed out into the hallway, posters going up on walls alongside small hollow stills, creating a colorful, glowing collage that Tubbo smiles at sleepily while he walks past. Queens know what the local time is. Not that it matters. All of them have busted-as-hell sleep schedules, and come and go so much they can't keep track of soul cycles anyway. So it's not surprising at all when Tubbo passes other syndicate members on the way to the mess hall, some shuffling around in pajamas, and others in dusty field gear. The mess hall isn't huge, but it could maybe fit all of them if they were ever here all at once. Orange and red banners hang from the rafters and flutter a little in the recycled air pumping through the station. Mismatched sets of tables and chairs or benches scattered around the room at regular intervals. It's decently crowded right now, so it must be some normalish eating time. And Tubbo covers up a yawn with one hand as he waves hello with his others to the people that call out to him in greeting. He wanders up to an open replicator and has to punch in his ID at least twice before he gets it right, swipes through the options until he finds what he wants. 
Tubbo grabs his glass once the replicator is done rehydrating the nectar, and it's not as good as anything from home, but it'll do. And he's looking for somewhere to sit when he hears, Yo, little stinger! Craning his neck to see where the voice came from, Tubbo spots it after a brief search, a molten orange arm waving in the air across the hall, and he ambles over to their table with a smile. Hey man, when'd you get in? Sapnap asks, as soon as he's close enough, the bright light coming out of his eyes always hard to look directly at. But Tubbo makes an attempt, squints, and shrugs his shoulders. Dunno, a few hours maybe? I passed out like right as I got back. Ha! <laughs> That's George after like every mission. Ain't that right, Georgie? Sapnap croons, leaning across the table to bat his sooty lashes at his teammate. And George rolls his eyes so hard, Tubbo's afraid he's sprained something. Slaps a hand at Sapnap's grinning face. Why is that funny? So what if I actually value getting proper rest? Aw, you need your beauty, sleep hog goggy. Please. If anyone needs beauty rest, it's you, Sap. You fucking bitch. How'd your mission go, Tubbo? Dream cuts in smoothly over his teammate's bickering, pats the seat next to him with one long, bone-white hand, and Tubbo plops down, sipping at his drink contemplatively. It was a simple job. Pick up some cargo here, drop it off there, don't get shot. Again. Don't shoot anyone super important, and it went off fine, but that's the problem. There was no problem. Tubbo had autopilot on for most of the trip, and had to distract himself with doing repairs to the Asachi. Which he loved doing, don't get him wrong. But it wasn't as much of a thrill as making a run for it from local authorities. Eh, it was okay. Kind of boring. Tubbo eventually settles on, looks up at Dream's vapid, never-changing smile, and the shifter hums, tilting his round head to the side. Techno still got you on D-ranks. Yes! Tubbo groans, dramatically collapsing forwards onto the table, sticks his chin out, and pouts at nothing in particular. He hasn't had to do D-rank since he first joined, and even then it was only for, like, a week, just so they could make sure he wasn't going to cut and run with whatever profits he made before paying out his share. Dream makes a sympathetic noise next to him, long fingers tapping a beat against the tabletop. I'm sorry, I know that must really suck. Have you tried talking to him? And what am I supposed to say to the fucking blade? You know how stubborn he is? Tubbo snips, rolling his head to the side to half-heartedly glare at Dream's never-changing face. The cartoonish smile and dot eyes so out of place for most conversations, this one included. Dude, just be up front. Threaten to quit or something. Sapnap chimes in, having finished bitching at George, and Tubbo sits up clapping two hands together while he throws the others out, sarcastically gushing. Oh, what a great idea! I'm sure he'll be super intimidated at me saying I'm going to leave the organization that's the only thing stopping me from getting arrested immediately. Oh, right. Sapnap deflates a little, likely because he forgot that not everyone here is like him, that most people have records and rap sheets and someone dogging their tail. That a lot of them are here specifically because Technoblade, the Blood God, Scourge of the Seventeen Systems, has got enough infamy and clout to drive off practically anything with the functioning brain stock. Hey, Sap's got a point. Not the threatening bit. Dream's voice goes sharp in reprimand when Sapnap perks up, and he folds his arms together, grumbling under his breath as Dream uses a gentler tone when saying to Tubbo, Directness is probably the best way to go with Techno. One of his hands lightly touches at Tubbo's shoulder, there for the briefest second, but it feels like Tubbo's been electrocuted. All of the overwhelming energy Dream radiates zapping under his skin, and the shifter tips his head to the side, says kindly, You've been with us long enough. You'll listen to what you have to say. Tubbo snorts around the edge of his glass, isn't so sure of that himself, but doesn't press the issue, lets the conversation flow onto other things. He listens raptly while the other three regale him with their latest missions and bags, living vicariously through their stories, even though bounty hunting has never been his favorite. 
just hearing Sapnap excitedly tell him about some chase through a crowded market. Having to dodge blaster fire and the searing hot reach of thermal blades has Tubbo on the edge of his seat. Antenna perked forwards at attention. Wings flared open a little and quivering behind him. He's missed the thrill of the chase so badly. Wants to feel the heady adrenaline of swerving photon blasts. The unmatched elation, knowing he's outflown them. That he's good and fast and he left them in his star trails. It's more that than anything else that convinces him to message Techno. And Tubbo taps out a quick question on his way back to his room, chewing on a thumb absently while his other hands type. Boss man. He, you got a sec to talk? Reply. Office. No time is given, so Tubbo just assumes he's supposed to go now. Spins on his heel and heads back out to the communal hub. Waits at one of the elevator banks and punches the button for the top floor once he gets inside. Anyone outside of the Syndicate would guess that Technoblade's office has to be something dark and brooding, with blood-stained weapons lined along the walls and heads on spikes. And while there are weapons hung up, they're all clean and well taken care of, reflecting the yellowed lights bobbing around the room. There's honestly more bookshelves than anything, piled high with hollow texts and real bound paper copies. Trinkets and other oddities scattered around the room, collected over decades of exploring countless worlds. The focal point of the room is a large desk, backed by a wide viewport that looks out at the red giant, filling the room with its warm light. It's cozy, actually. Any harsh angles softened by vibrant syndicate banners or patterned rugs in reds and oranges. Unmade bed pushed up to the wall in one corner, Papers and hollow tablets spread out on the covers, and there's not many hollow stills up, but all of them show smiling faces, fearsome teeth bared in exuberant grins. Sitting behind his desk is the blood god himself, and even without the cape and trident, Techno is still an imposing figure. Though the image of a fearsome criminal organization leader is ruined somewhat by the sleep ruffled hair and reading glasses perched on the edge of his nose. He's typing away at something on his console, steaming mug sitting by his elbow, which means Phil must have just left. He inclines his head when Tubbo comes in. Take a seat if you're going to be a minute, otherwise just start talking. The bluntness isn't any indication to his mood, and that's just how techno is, but it definitely sets those faint of heart on edge when speaking with the crime lord. Tubbo's not really afraid of him anymore, after you've seen a man almost cry trying to get the coffee maker to work while wearing pajamas with small, fluffy animals on them, it kind of lessens any tension you might have. But that doesn't mean he's not a little nervous approaching the desk. Mind your tongue, he could throw you out on your ass so fast, Tubbo thinks, wrapping his hands around the back of one of the chairs, knows that all that's standing between him and some imperial jail cell is his skills and the fact that Techno likes him, or more likely, is generally ambivalent towards him as long as he's useful. I won't be long. Just wanted to talk to you about mission assignments. Tubbo begins, hesitantly, and Techno doesn't stop typing as he grunts. There's a new group of D-ranks that just came in if you want first pick. Tubbo grimaces, glad Techno's so occupied and didn't see the face he pulled. Clears his throat and tips his head to the side. Yeah, about that, I, um, it's, I think I'm more than ready to be put back on the main roster and no. His sentence grinds to a halt, and Tubbo blinks his eyes wide, can't help stuttering out a series of protests at the instant refusal. M what? But I, you didn't even let me... And, and I'm fine, and you let Dream- Okay, first off, you were shot with a Class A photon laser that shattered three of your ribs and tore a nice, fist-sized hole right through your abdominal muscles, so no, you are not fine. Techno says, hands halting on his keyboard as he finally turns blood-red eyes on Tubbo, gold caps on his tusks flashing in the light of his monitors. And second, Dream's basically a stupid, unkillable fuck. 
got a healing factor that exceeds anything I've ever seen. But the real reason he got back to active duty so quickly is because he has two partners. Not just one, but two. Tubbo's upper hands clench around the back of the chair at what he's implying. His lower two dropping to wrap around his abdomen, careful with his left side. And of course, Techno tracks the movement, shoots him an unimpressed look over the rim of his glasses. Look, as soon as that wound heals, I'll put you back on the main rotation. Or you could finally get a partner. Your choice. Tubbo seriously considers it for a moment, if it would get him off D-ranks, but he can't think of anyone else he'd want sitting in his co-pilot's seat, because there's only one person he trusts entirely with his life, and he already said no, is on his way to being a Sunfleet captain. Thunking his head down on the chair back in defeat, Tubbo groans. But it's going to take weeks for this to heal properly. Them's the breaks. Techno, please, I, I'm going insane doing supply runs. Please, just, can you give me one heist or arms deal something? Tebo begs, tipping his head up to stare as plaintively as he can. And Techno sighs, turning back to his monitors with barely a change in facial expression. I can't, under good conscience, send you out there with a hole in your side and no one watching your back. Irritation spikes through Tubbo, because everyone always acts like he can't take care of himself. That having another pair of eyes is going to do any better at keeping him out of harm's way, and he can't help snarking in frustration. You going soft or something, blood god? He clicks his mouth shut immediately after, wary over what Techno's going to do. But he just snorts, shoots him a look out of the corner of his eye. Hardly. You're just a good pilot and not a complete idiot. You pay out your share with no complaints and aren't miserable to work with. It would be an inconvenience if you died, so I'm trying to prevent that from happening. Well, I'm gonna die if you keep me on D-ranks. Tebo fires back, knows it's a weak argument, and watches Techno's lip curl up in a small smile as he says, Eh, you'll be fine. Tebo doesn't know what to do now. He said his piece and Techno refused. So he rakes frustrated hands through his hair, trying to decide if it'd be worse to pick a new D-rank supply run or stay at HQ until his side healed completely. Both sound absolutely terrible, and Tubbo wrinkles his nose, heart rate starting to pick up because he feels like he's trapped, like there's nowhere for him to go. No way out, nowhere to go, just do as you're told, Ensign. Look, I'm not trying to be uncooperative here. I think I'm a pretty reasonable guy. But, and I'm not sending you out on anything dangerous, but there's this A rank. Yes, Tebo says instantly, shooting forwards to practically hang over the chair back, wings fluttering behind him excitedly, and Techno rolls his eyes. Don't get too excited. It's just an escort, but it pays nice and... Here, just read it. He types a few commands into his keyboard, flicks around a hollow screen, and Tubbo moves to drop into the chair he's been standing behind, absent-mindedly chewing on one thumb while he flicks through the mission parameters. Pick up here, drop off there, blah blah blah. Heart seizing in his chest when he sees typed out in bolded block letters. Drop off location? Nerox, Sunfleet Academy. Sunfleet? Nerox? Tommy? Queens, he could see Tommy. It's been about three rotations since Tubbo's seen him, because Tommy is busy with school and Tubbo can't go anywhere near Nerox anymore. But if he's there on official syndicate business, the High Council will have no jurisdiction over him despite the active warrants out. He could finally see Tommy, after three rotations, get to give him a real hug, hear his laughter without the snap and crackle of long-distance static and Tubbo hardly pays attention to the rest of the file. Already knows he's going to accept it for that reason alone, but then he makes it down to the payout, and his eyes blow wide. Queens of ages past! Ah, I see you've reached the bottom. Is... is this... there's no way this is real! Tubbo exclaims, 
looking up at Techno in disbelief. And the man shrugs. They may be Imperial dogs, but the Ender are always good for the money. Only reason I didn't toss the request out. Tubbo snaps his head down to the last line, counts and recounts the number before saying incredulously, Ten thousand credits? Heh, <laughs> yeah. You taking it or not? Techno asks, one eyebrow cocked like he knows it's a stupid question. And Tubbo laughs quick and sharp, because it is. Shakes his head and lets the hollow screen drift back to the other side of the desk. Of fucking course. Escorts are generally up there with supply runs. Worse, sometimes, if you get a real dick. But Tubbo could literally not care less about whose ass he's going to be hauling clear across the galaxy. Because with that kind of money, even after the syndicate's cut, and the added bonus of seeing his best friend, Tubbo would gladly take the devil himself. An excerpt from the Declassified Galactic Survival Guide when modern archivists are attempting to explain Nerox's supremacy in this age, they often cite that it was Neroxan scientists that discovered and perfected light-speed technology, thus providing an elegant answer that couldn't be further from the truth. Light-speed technology was developed across a slew of planets and systems, but under the well-oiled machine that is Neroxian imperialism, such innovations were easily lumped beneath the sunlight banner, any and all names lost to the flow of time, unless they were of proper Neroxan heritage. Since then, the Imperial Sunfleet has been the leading force for continued research into spaceflight, along with its greatest patron, as the Neroxan Empire funnels most of the Empire's available funds into this institution. With a vast array of planets to draw resources and taxes from, it comes as no surprise that the Sun Empire is one of the richest in the whole universe, but the largest contributor to this overall wealth is a seemingly unassuming, honestly, miserably frozen little hellhole at the far reaches of one of the galactic arms. Anwil is generally one of the most depressing places to ever exist, shrouded in darkness for half its solar year, which is eight times the length of literally any other inhabited planet and should have little to nothing to offer the galaxy. But, unfortunately, it's the only place that grows end crystals like most other sensible planets grow weeds. The path he takes to Anwil isn't as clear-cut as most other pilots would probably fly, but Tubbo's got his scanner open, listening for where sections of the Sunfleet are. Has to course-correct any time he's in danger of running through their flight path. It's more out of an abundance of caution than anything. All of the squadrons popping up are made of large battle-class ships. Their captains aren't going to be interested in hunting down one lone smuggler. But you never know. And the last thing Tubbo wants to jeopardize right now is his chance at seeing Tommy. <sighs> Tommy. His hands tighten around the controls just as he's jumped to light speed again. Suddenly swamped with memories he's been desperately trying to keep alive, but to his growing horror only seems to get dimmer by the rotation. They fade out softly, crumbling in around the edges, and Tubbo can hardly remember now the sound of Tommy's quiet breathing from the bed next to his, the feel of his hand in one of Tubbo's, helping haul him up from the training mats, what it was like sitting shoulder to shoulder in the mess, the shape of his arms wrapped tight around Tubbo, Grey wings engulfing him in an embrace that smelled entirely of Tommy, something he used to know by heart, but would have trouble even guessing at these days. Tubbo flips through his handheld while hyperspace streaks past, and stares for a long time at the call log history. There's two missed calls from Tommy that came in seconds after Tubbo hung up on him, and that's it. He used to try longer than that before giving up, at the beginning even would call until Tubbo caved and picked up. But this last time, he hadn't even left a voicemail, just sent a quick message. From Dickhead. Hope you get back safe. Let me know when would be good to call again. He hasn't responded yet because he's worried about jinxing it. Wants to be on the way to Nerox before saying anything, and that's it. There's no other reason for him to be avoiding Tommy. 
and he's not avoiding him. Okay? But Tubbo's fingers hover over the message bubble with a tremor in them that he refuses to acknowledge. Locking his handheld, Tubbo shoves it into a pocket so he doesn't have to think. Won't be tempted by it. Cranks up the music until it's screaming out of the speakers and huddles into himself in his pilot's chair. Keeps his head facing straight forward, but he can still see the empty spot next to him out of the corner of his eye. It's somewhat of a relief when he drops out of light speed, and hanging before him like a hole in space is Anvil, its dark, craggy surface reflecting back what little light makes it out this far in the system. Tubbo begins punching in the coordinates that were in the mission briefing that'll take him to the pickup spot. Begins the process of taking the Asachi out of orbit with minimal turbulence. As soon as he breaks through the atmosphere, an alert pops up on his dash from a source that's not registered in his systems, and Tubbo opens the audio channel one-handed while he lazily steers towards his coordinates. Unauthorized breach of royal airspace. Turn around now or face the consequences. A deep voice intones over the speakers in the warping accent of the Ender, and Tubbo flicks fast through his files, huffing. Relax. I have credentials if you just... A new alert pops up. Data transfer requested. And Tubbo more than eagerly pushes his files through the channel. Static and soft, muffled, echoing voices in the background. But eventually, the air traffic controller intones. Cleared for landing at Voidfall. Stand by for port assignment. Radio. Tubbo says absentmindedly, staring out his viewport at the glittering city that spread out before him, all elegant twining spires and arches of softly glowing light. And there, at the center of the city, rising like a huge, gracefully sweeping wave is a massive structure with more gold and queen's past end crystals than he's ever seen. It can't be anything other than their palace and Tubbo whistles long and low, thinks he's going to be skirting past it, and that's why air control freaked out. But his hands twitch around the controls when his GPS is telling him the coordinates are at the palace. The hell? Tubbo mutters, turning to double-check he put the right cords in when the air traffic controller comes back on to say, Craft IK 97-5-R-0, proceed to void fall auxiliary port 3. A new set of coordinates pop up on the screen, and Tubbo inputs them into the system in bafflement. But they're right, and he's confused. Thankfully, can go through the steps of landing the Asachi with less than optimal mental capabilities. Queens, he really should have read the briefing more than he did. Must be picking up a diplomat or something. Maybe some noble's kid? And Tubbo throws a hasty look over his shoulder. Glad he keeps the Asachi relatively clean. He's seen how some of the other syndicate members keep their ships, shudders at the mere memory, while sliding down the ladder into the cargo hold, zips his bomber up because he can already guess with how far it is out in the system, the surface temperature of Anvil is probably freezing. Even though he's expecting it, the instant Tubbo opens the cargo bay hatch and glacial, icy air rushes inside, he sucks in a startled breath regrets it almost immediately, with the way it feels like his lungs freeze shut. He normally doesn't mind the cold, but not like this, where it's like the true cold of empty space, not just the comforting chill that seeps in through ships and stations. His antenna flatten as close to his skull as they can, wings tucking tighter to his body, and he shivers, buries his nose in the collar of his bomber and wishes he'd packed his sub-zero temp one. He's got to go out there, though. Can't stay huddled in the relative warmth of the Asachi. So Tubbo sucks in stinging air through his teeth and clomps down the ramp, finally stepping out onto the planet properly. Tubbo's never been to Anwil before. Hasn't really ever had a reason to. For starters, it's about as far as you can get in the galaxy and still technically be in it. Located at the very end of one of Andromeda's trailing arms, and even for its own system, Anvil is at the very outskirts, the local sun just a weak, pale dot in the sky overhead. 
Honestly, the only reason anyone even bothers with Anwil is the other reason he's never been here before. Because he can't afford them. But stepping out onto the landing port, Tubbo has to do a double take when he first sees it. Mouth dropping open, because they're just using end crystals like fucking street lamps here. Ever since getting the Asachi, he's been fantasizing about one day upgrading its engines to run off an end crystal reactor which is realistically a really stupid pipe dream. The Imperial Sunfleet runs on end crystals. There's no way Tubbo's ever going to be able to pay for that kind of tech. But still, he's daydreamed about it near constantly. He's never actually seen one in person. And now he's just standing under the rich teal glow of scores of them. And even though his antennae are tucked under his hair, trying to keep warm, they can still pick up the massive amounts of energy vibrating all around him. What the fuck? Tubbo mumbles under his breath, spinning in a slow circle with his mouth open. Probably looks like some idiot tourist, but he can't help it. They're everywhere. Tall pillars made of a dark, glassy material ring the landing pad, end crystals clustered at their tops to make up for the weak light that comes from the sun overhead. But Tubbo can see more in the distance, glittering on buildings and spacecraft. Queens of fucking ages past, Tubbo knew the Ender were wealthy. That was just common knowledge, like how water is generally wet and you can't breathe in space. But he didn't know how rich they were until now. And merciful queens are they ever rich. Tubbo's drawn out of his boggling when he sees a figure moving out to the corner of his eye. Spins quickly with one hand dropping instinctually to a blaster at his side, but relaxes once he makes out the tall, willowy figure of an Endyrian. They're dressed fancy, well-tailored clothes in teals and purples, brooch with a small end crystal glittering at the high collar of their shirt, and Tubbo figures this has to be his client, shuffles himself up straight in a more presentable posture, and sticks a hand out. Hey, I'm Tubbo. I'm going to be a pilot. The Endyrian doesn't even move to take his hand, which is not a good sign. Just glares down their nose at him with narrowed green eyes, something imperious and condescending in every line of their face as they drawl. Pleasure. We'll begin loading his highness's things immediately. You should plan to take off in half an imperial hour. W wait you're not- I- His highness- Tubbo stumbles out, but the man is gone, disappearing in a rush of purple particles. And as more Ender pop in, carrying crates and bags, he thinks he might, potentially, have a problem. That maybe he should have read that mission briefing a bit more closely than he did. But it's not until after all the servants have finished loading his cargo hold, and he's been standing around freezing his antenna off for the better part of an hour and a half and the royal pain in his ass still hasn't shown up, that Tubbo knows he has a problem. Blowing air into his cupped palms to try and warm his frozen fingers up, Tubbo eyes the crates stacked in his hold, most of them inlaid with a faint sheen of bright teal, and wonders how much he would get for those bare scraps of end crystal, if it would be worth it to just hightail it right now. Before he can make that call, there's a soft noise behind him he's gotten very familiar with, and Tubbo turns to see the man from earlier with purple particles fizzing out around him. But he's not alone this time. Standing next to him, with a cocked chin, a dozen shining end crystals scattered around his attire, clustered in the circlet on his head, is a young Endarian that has to be the prince. He's tall, like all the Ender are, lanky in a way that's just slightly unsettling. But the thing Tubbo notices immediately are his eyes because where every Endyrian he's seen so far has been near identical. Same dark skin and hair, long faces and slitted green eyes, the prince has one searing red eye. I have the honor and distinct privilege of introducing Prince Ranbu third of his name, tenth, no, excuse me, twelfth in line for the throne of Ender. The man says, with a flourishing sweep of his arm, tail flicking behind him serenely, 
and Tubbo fights back a groan because he hates all of this pompous crap, turns to stare at the prince, Ranbu, and holds out a slightly shaking hand. Nice to meet you, Ranbu. I'm Tubbo, your pilot. It's a perfectly normal thing to say, and yeah, Tubbo's teeth might be chattering, but he sounds friendly enough. But Ranbu's mismatched eyes narrow, arms folding tightly behind his back as he snips. If you must address me, it's either as Your Highness or Prince Ranbu. Do you understand? Excuse me? Tubbo blurts without thinking, and the prince sniffs, jerking his head to the side and sticking his nose in the air. You're excused this time. I can't imagine you've had much experience dealing with royalty before. Tubbo tries to keep his mouth from dropping open, has a few alternatives for what he could call King Jackass over here besides your highness. But if he does, he's for sure losing this job, which means not seeing Tommy, and no nice pile of credits in his account. Remember, you said the devil himself. Tubbo curls his fingers into his palm, drops his now clenched fist back to his side. Just get this pompous dickbag to Nerox and then you get to see Tommy. You can do this. Crystal clear, your highness. He can't help the way he bites the title out. And it's so sour coming from his mouth. Like when he used to clap a clenched fist over his chest and utter as one of hundreds, Sir, yes, sir. No matter how scathing his tone... It seems to appease his royal assholeness, his tail swishing briefly before going still once more. Excellent. Well, let's get going, then. The prince doesn't even offer his servant, aid, guy, whatever, any parting words. Just sweeps past Tubbo into the cargo hold of the Asachi. Dark cloak with glowing, geometric designs fluttering behind him as he calls over his shoulder. Pilot, where are my quarters? Um. Tubbo looks back from him to where the aide was, but the man is gone, last of his purple particles fizzing out around where he used to be, and Tubbo cocks his head to the side. The abrupt departure is a little odd, especially considering he's more or less entrusting his prince to the care of some stranger. Didn't even make Tubbo promise to keep him safe or anything. Just left, like he couldn't be bothered. Pilot. I asked you a question, Ranbu's huffy voice demands from behind him, and Tubbo turns with a scowl, already hating his tone, the pure condescension dripping from it, like he's somehow better than Tubbo just because of the family he was born into, just because of the stupid glowing rocks around his head. Sir, yes, sir, sit down, shut up, do as you're told, Ensign. And Tubbo grits his teeth against the nasty emotions rising in his chest, the burning anger he hasn't felt in so long, itching in his fingertips like he needs to shred something. He trumps up the ramp into the cargo hold and slams his fist into the button that'll close them in from the endless, frozen black wasteland that is Anwil. Inside, it's even more apparent how tall the prince is, the long sweep of his horns almost, but not quite, brushing the ceiling and Tubbo suddenly doesn't know if he's even going to fit in one of the Asachi's bunks. He huffs out a mean laugh at the thought of his pompous ass having to sleep on the floor. What, what are you... I... Were you... Even listening to me? The prince snaps, ears flicking back and sending the gold jewelry he wears swinging around, righteous indignation snarling his lips up to bare his fangs. Don't forget I'm paying you. And when I ask you a question, I expect you to answer. What? An absolutely miserable fuckhead. No wonder the aide just left without saying goodbye. Tubbo would have too. But now he's stuck with the little shit for the next day while they make the jump to Nerox. For half a second, he imagines getting them into orbit and hurling this spoiled Ender Prince out of the airlock. And the immense satisfaction Tubbo feels is enough to calm his pounding heart. It's a little over a day. You just have to not kill him. He takes in a deep breath, closes his eyes briefly, and imagines soft, gray speckled wings wrapping around him. Warm hands, warm smile, warm voice. Play your cards right, and it'll be real tomorrow. 
You'll get to hug Tommy, hear his laugh, see his smile. Sorry, Tubbo says in a clipped tone, lets all the air out of his lungs, and tries again, flicking his eyes open to see Ronbu glaring at him, stupidly long arms folded across his chest. I... You're right. Sorry for not answering sooner. Ronbu harumphs and jerks his head to the side, something really off about the way he holds himself. Good. Make sure it doesn't happen again. Think about Tommy, think about the credits, think about how you'll never have to see him again in 36 hours. Tebo violently repeats as he inclines his head, dredging up whatever that used to be in him that kept him still and quiet while he saluted in a line with dozens of others. Of course, your highness. Please, let me show you where to put your things. But as Tubbo's climbing up the ladder to the top deck, he remembers unwillingly how thin that band of control is, remembers what happened the last time it snapped, and he bites the inside of his cheek hard to keep the furious scream inside.